chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and Director Comey. Thanks for being here. Um, I was a bit astounded when you said the FBI is unable to control who a witness coming in voluntarily brings into an interview. Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot of FBI agents tell people who could come in to an interview and who could not. And in this case, uh, and I'm sure you've, you've uh, heard some of the questions raised by uh, smart lawyers around the country about providing immunity to people like Cheryl Mills in return for her presenting a laptop that you had every authority to get a subpoena, and if you had brought a, um, a uh, request for a search warrant, based on what we now know, I would have had no problem signing that warrant so you could go get it anywhere you want. And in fact, I've talked to uh, former U.S. attorneys, AUSAs, who have said if an FBI agent came in and recommended that we give immunity to a witness to get her laptop that we could get with a subpoena or warrant, then I would ask the FBI not to ever allow this agent on a case. Can you explain succinctly why you chose to give immunity without a proffer of what was on the laptop, give immunity to Cheryl Mills while she was a, an important witness and you could have gotten her laptop with a warrant or subpoena? Sure, I'll give you my best shot. Uh, the immunity we're calling about here and the details really matter that we're talking about is act of production immunity, which says we want you to give us a thing. We won't use anything we find on that thing directly against you. Right. It's a fairly. Well, free and I understand that. And I understood that from reading the immunity deal. And that's what's so shocking, because she was working directly with Hillary Clinton. And therefore, it's expected since she the evidence indicates she was pretty well copied on so many of the emails that Hillary Clinton was using that uh, pretty much anything in there uh, would have been usable against her. And, that's and what I you cleaned the slate before you ever knew. Now, Can I you know, some of the transact, some of the immunities you gave. The last paragraph mentions a proffer. Was there a proffer of what? the witness would say before the immunity deals were given to those that got those immunities. Can I answer first, though, your question about why I think it made sense to have active production immunity for the Cheryl Mills' laptop? Uh, I'd rather my time is so okay. limited. Right. Please. Yeah, but, um, it's an important question, and, and I think there's a reasonable answer, but I'll give it another time. Uh, the the uh, I think in at least one of the cases, and I'm mixing up the guys, but with Mr. Cambetta, maybe also with Mr. Pagliano. No, I got that wrong. It's yes or no. Did you have a proffer from them as to what they would say before you gave them immunity? I believe there was a proffer session governed by what I just referred to as called a queen for a day agreement with at least one of them to try and understand what they would say. But because the deals that I've seen back 30 years ago before I went to the bench, the FBI would say, you and the DOJ, of course, we know FBI can't give immunity. It has to come from DOJ, just like it's not the FBI's job to say what a reasonable prosecutor should do or not do. You give them the evidence, and then you let them decide. But a proffer is made saying, this is what my client will say. Then the DOJ decides, based on that proffer, Here's the plea we'll offer. Here's the immunity we'll offer. And if your client deviates from that proffer, the deal's off. You got really nothing substantial. It's as if you went into the investigation determined to give immunity to people instead of getting a warrant. You gave immunity to people that you would need to make a case if a case were going to be made. And I know we have people across the aisle that are saying, well, it's only because she's a presidential candidate. It happens to be, in my case, I wouldn't care whether she was a presidential candidate or not. What is important to maintaining a civilization with justice and fairness is a little righteousness where people are treated fairly across the board. And it does not appear 
that in this case, it comports with anything that FBI agents with centuries of experience have told me they've never seen anything like this. So one other thing, I know this happened before your watch, but under Director Mueller, Kim Jensen, who prepared 700 pages of training material for those who would go undercover and try to embed with Al-Qaeda, it was wiped out because CARE and some of the people that were in unindicted co-conspirators named in your Holy Land Foundation trial, they said, we don't like them. They do not allow agents to know what Kim Jensen put in that 700 pages that was so accurate, so good about Islam that we could embed people in Al-Qaeda and they wouldn't suspect them. I would encourage you to start training your FBI agents so whether they're in San Bernardino, Orlando, New Jersey, wherever, they can talk to a radicalized Islamist and determine whether they're radicalized. Without Kim Jensen's type material, you'll never be able to spot them again and we'll keep having people die. Uh, thank you. My time's expired. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the director is uh, permitted to respond if he chooses to do so. I don't think I have anything at this point. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, director Comey, during this committee's oversight hearing last year, I asked you about the cases of Sherry Chen and Xiao Shang Chi, both U.S. citizens who were arrested by the FBI, accused of different crimes related to economic uh, espionage for China, only to have those charges dropped without explanation. Since you last testified before the committee, both cases have been closed. Now, I know that you may not be personally familiar with the individual's cases or may not be inclined to comment on the facts of these cases to the committee today. However, would you be willing to provide a written explanation or possibly a summary of the investigations to clarify how and why the FBI handled the cases the way they did? I don't want to commit to that sitting here. We would certainly consider what we can supply consistent with things like the Privacy Act, but uh, we'll certainly consider it. I'm, I'm familiar with the case. I remember our, our, your yeah. questions about it last year. And so we'll take a look at what we can share with you. We can't obviously do it in an open forum in any event. I understand that, I, I, but I appreciate the consideration. Uh, now I'd like to address a different topic. Um, uh, Dr. Director Comey, your agency recently introduced an online initiative aimed at promoting education and awareness about violent extremism called Don't Be a Puppet. Mm -hmm. This program was designed to serve as a tool for teachers and students to prevent young people from being drawn toward violent extremism. However, national education groups, faith groups, and community organizations have raised serious concerns about the way in which the program presents the problem of violent extremism. Particularly troublesome is the website's charge that teachers and students should look for warning signs that a person may be on a slippery slope of violent extremism and to report activity that may, may or may not be indicative of radicalization. For instance, the website encourages students and teachers to report when others use unusual language or talk about traveling to suspicious places. The user of the website, however, is left to draw inferences about what constitutes a suspicious place or, or what language is unusual enough to be reported to a trusted authority. For example, a trip to France or Germany, which hosts many far-right extremist groups, may not sound suspicious to many users. But a trip to Saudi Arabia or Iraq home to various Muslim holy sites, possibly would. So on August 9th, um, the American Federation of Teachers led uh, a number of national groups in a letter written to you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I'd like to submit this for the record. And um, among the many concerns they raise is the potential for such initiatives to exacerbate the profiling and bullying of students of Middle Eastern background uh, that, that, and what they over of and above what they already experience. So how do you respond to the concerns expressed by the American Federation of Teachers about the impact of the FBI's Don't Be a Puppet program and the effect it may have on schools and immigrant communities? Well, thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad they shared their feedback. Boy, I hope either before or after the feedback, they go on and actually go through the Don't Be a Puppet, because I've done it. 
I honestly can't understand the concerns. It's a very common sense thing. One of our big challenges is how, if a kid starts to go sideways towards violence, the people closest to him are going to see something likely. How do we get folks to a place where they're sensitized to make common sense judgments that this person may be headed in a very dangerous direction? It's never going to be perfect, but I actually think a lot of thought went into this, including faith groups, all kinds of civic groups, to make sure we got something that was good common sense uh, education for kids and for teachers. And so I'm a, I'm a little bit at a loss. I, maybe we ought to meet with them. They can show me which parts of it they actually think are problematic. But I think it's a pretty darn good piece of work is my overall reaction. So, so Director Comey, you've, you've gone to the website and, and, and looked at it. So what then would you consider to be a place that sounds suspicious? Or what would you consider to be an unusual language that somebody is speaking so much so that a student should report them to the authorities. I think what it says is speaking, using unusual language, not, not, uh, not speaking Pashto or French or German. I think it means speaking in an unusual way about things. Uh, and suspicious place Syria leaps to my mind. If someone is talking to classmates about thinking about traveling to Syria, the classmates ought to be sensitized to that, the teacher ought to be sensitized to it so we can try and intervene with that kid before we have to lock them up for most of their life. But do you have evidence to show that this program is actually count countering recruiting efforts by violent extremists? I don't, but it sure makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, it seems like, again, a common sense way to equip kids to resist the siren song that comes from radical Islamists or skinhead groups or hate groups of different kinds. And so look, it's not, I'm sure it's not perfect because nothing in life is. We'd welcome feedback, but the general idea makes a lot of sense to me. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, in your opening comments, you said this was an unusual case. I, I would say that's the understatement of the year. Husband of the subject meets with the Attorney General three days before Secretary Clinton is interviewed by the FBI. Nine people get to sit in with Secretary Clinton during that interview. One of those was her Chief of Staff, Cheryl Mills, who was the subject of the investigation. Five people get some kind of immunity. Five people get some kind of immunity, yet no one is prosecuted. Three of those people who get immunity take the fifth in front of Congress, and one of them doesn't even bother to show up when he's subpoenaed. He's supposed to have been at that very chair you're sitting at. And of course, the Attorney General announces that she's going to follow your recommendations, even though she doesn't know what those recommendations are, the only time she's ever done that. So of course this was unusual. We've never seen anything like this, which sort of brings me to the, the post. I'd like to put up the post that some have talked about, which is the post by Mr. Combetta on Reddit. And you said earlier that you don't know if you uh, examined this during your investigation, so let's examine it now. I need to strip out a VIP's address from a bunch of archived email. Basically, they don't want the VIP's email address exposed to anyone. Now, Director, when I hear the term strip out email address, I think of somebody's trying to hide something, somebody's trying to cover up something, and it sort of raises an important question from these two sentences. Who's the they? who wants something hid, and who's the VIP who also wants something hid? Director Comey, is it likely the VIP, refer well, actually not just a VIP, it's a very, very important person according to Mr. Combetta. Is it likely that that person is Secretary Clinton? Yes, sure. Okay, and is it also likely that the they refers to her Secretary Clinton staff and specifically Cheryl Mills? I don't know that. Either her, her lawyers or some staff that had tasked him with the production. So one other thing that's important on that, if we could put that back up, one other thing that's important is the date. The date at the top says July 24th, 2014. So whenever I see a date, I'm sure you do the same thing, I always look at what's happening about that same time frame, what may have happened directly before that, and maybe directly after that. So I went back to your reports that you guys had uh, given to us. The first report back last month, August 18th, 2016, page 15. On page 15 it says, during the summer of 2014, State indicated to Cheryl Mills, State Department indicated to Cheryl Mills a request for Clinton's work-related emails would be forthcoming. State Department gives Cheryl Mills a heads up that she's got to go round up all of Secretary Clinton's email. On that same page, it says the House Select Committee on Benghazi had reached an agreement with the State Department regarding production of documents on July 23rd, 2014, just the day before, which I find kind of interesting. Then from your report that we got just last week, after reviewing several documents dated in and around J 
July 23, 2014, Paul Cumbetta had a conversation with Cheryl Mills. And after reviewing a July 24th, there's that date again, 2014 email from Brian Pagliano, Paul Cumbetta explained Cheryl Mills was concerned Clinton's then current email address would be disclosed publicly. So, sure looks to me like it's Secretary Clinton, as you said, but also that it's Cheryl Mills and Brian Pagliano who are urging Mr. Combetta to cover this stuff up. You agree? From what you read, it sure sounds like they're trying to figure out a way to strip out the actual email address from what they produce. Well, they're actually trying to strip it all out. PST filed everything. Here's the, here's, here's, here's the takeaway in my mind. Mills gets a heads up, Cheryl Mills gets a heads up in midsummer of 2014. July 23rd, the day before Mr. Cumbetta's Reddit post, the Benghazi Committee and the State Department reached an agreement on production of documents. Cheryl Mills has a conversation with Paul Cumbetta. He goes on Reddit then and tries to figure out how he can get rid of all this email, even though he's not successful then. He has to do it later down the road with bleach bit. And then the clincher, the clincher. Just last week, he's going online and trying to delete these Reddit posts. He's trying to cover up his tracks. He's trying to cover up the cover-up. So I guess the question is, and someone's asked it earlier, in light of all this, are you thinking about reopening the investigation? I may have misunderstood what you said during the question. I don't understand that to be talking about deleting the emails. I understand to be talking about removing from the from line the actual email address. And, but uh, anyhow, I, maybe I misunderstood you, but the well, answer... the same guy later bleach bit, took bleach bit and did, did delete emails. Sure, yeah. So That's my, my question is, the, the guy you gave immunity to, the guy who took the fifth in front of us, is online trying to figure out how to remove email addresses, change evidence, later uses bleach bit, that guy, who won't testify in front of Congress, and he has correspondence with Cheryl Mills, Cheryl Mills, a subject of the investigation, Cheryl Mills, who also got some kind of immunity agreement, Cheryl Mills, who walked out of certain questions, walked out for part of the questions during the interview with the FBI, seems to me that's pretty compelling, and the timeline's pretty compelling as well. I'm not, I'm not following compelling of what? There's no doubt that Combetta was involved in deleting emails. Uh, after, he, conversations, he had the, after conversations with Cheryl Mills. He had the O-S-H-I-T moment, as he told us. And that's why it was very important for us to interview this guy to find out who told you to do that, why did you do that. That's why he was given use of it. Did you know about the Reddit post when you interviewed him? I, I, as I said earlier, I think we did. I, I, I think our investigators did. I'm not positive as I sit here. Mr. Chairman, I, I, for the, I mean, the guy's trying to, do, to cover up the Reddit post where he's trying to figure out how he can cover up the email addresses. And I find that compelling, particularly in light of the fact that just the day before, he's talking with Cheryl Mills and, and the State Department is on notice that the Benghazi Committee wants these very documents. I find that compelling, but obviously the FBI didn't. And I, this is just one more, one more in that list of things that make this case highly unusual. I yield back. Question. The director is permitted to respond if he chooses to do so. No, I don't think so. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Comey, uh, the FBI is tasked with very serious responsibilities. You're on the front lines trying to prevent terrorist attacks. You're investigating public corruption. And as I told your agents, uh, on a recent visit to your Miami field office, I am grateful to you and your agents, all of the women and men of the FBI, for your dedication to the and commitment uh, to the pursuit of justice. Uh, we're most grateful. Now, one critical responsibility of the FBI is to investigate when American citizens violate federal laws involving uh, improper contacts with foreign governments. And Director Comey, if an American national goes outside government channels to negotiate with a foreign government on behalf of the United States, that's a very, very serious crime, one that would violate the Logan Act, which, as you know, is the law that prohibits unauthorized people from negotiating with foreign governments in the place of the United States government. Uh, Director Comey, would the FBI take allegations of Logan Act violations seriously? Is that within your jurisdiction? Yes, it's within our jurisdiction. And if you had credible evidence that someone had violated the Logan Act, would the FBI investigate that alleged violation of law? I think we have done many Logan Act viola uh, investigations over the years, and we certainly will in the future. And am I correct in assuming that you're familiar with 
publicly quoted comments from various intelligence sources that have said that Russia has targeted the United States with illegal state-directed hacking. I'm aware of the published reports. If an American citizen, Director Comey, conducted meetings with a Russian individual who has been sanctioned by the United States about potential weakening of U.S. sanctions policy in violation of the Logan Act, would the FBI investigate? I don't think it's appropriate to answer that. That gets too close to confirming or denying whether we have an investigation. It seems too close to real life, so I'm not going to comment. Okay, but, but there are, you have investigated Logan Act violations. It's something that's clearly within your jurisdiction. Um, I appreciate, Director Comey, your confirming that the FBI would treat these potential violations of law both seriously and urgently, because everything that I just outlined that you said the FBI would investigate has apparently happened already. Public reports suggest that the Logan Act may have been violated by Carter Page, one of the men Donald Trump singled out as the top foreign policy advisor, though now the campaign appears eager to revise Mr. Page's role given the attention rightly being given to his illicit negotiations with a sanctioned Russian official. I've read reports from Yahoo News from last week that law enforcement may already be looking into this issue, and I assume we all agree that the allegations are very serious. Russia, a nation that hacks America, a nation that continues to enable Assad, the Assad regime to slaughter the Syrian people, a nation that threatens and violates the territorial integrity of its neighbors and our European allies. It is a dangerous violation of federal law if Donald Trump's advisor, Carter Page, is engaging in freelance negotiations with Russia. And here's what we know. In March, Donald Trump named Carter Page as a foreign policy advisor. In July, Mr. Page traveled to Moscow to give a speech that was harshly critical of the United States. And during that trip, Mr. Page is reported to have also met with a Russian official named Igor Sechin, a member of Vladimir Putin's inner circle and the president of the petroleum company, Rosneft, who was sanctioned by the United States uh, under Executive Order 13361, prohibiting him from traveling to the United States or conducting business with U.S. firms. So Mr. Sechin has a clear and personal interest in lifting U.S. sanctions against him and other top Russian officials put in place by President Obama after Russia's military action in Ukraine. Now, if these two men met to discuss sanctions policy or a lifting of sanctions under a potential Trump administration, this would be enormously concerning. Just last week, the press reported that U.S. intelligence officials are seeking to determine whether an American businessman identified by Donald Trump as one of his foreign policy advisors has opened up private communications with senior Russian officials, including talks about the possible lifting of sanctions. Mr. Comey, it is illegal if Trump's advisor met with Russians who have been sanctioned by the United States about lifting these sanctions, and I am grateful for your reassurances this morning that the FBI would investigate potential violations of the Logan Act by any individual who engages in unauthorized negotiations with a foreign government. I remind my colleagues that Donald Trump invited Russia to hack the United States. I remind my colleagues that Donald Trump suggested breaking America's longstanding commitment to our NATO allies and weakening U.S. sanctions against Russia. Is there a connection between these reckless and dangerous policy proposals and the potential violation of the Logan Act by Donald Trump's Russia advisor. Mr. Comey, we appreciate very much the FBI's vigilance in pursuing justice. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman is permitted to respond if he chooses to do so. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Marino, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Director, for being here. I think we worked on a couple of cases together, our yep. districts. Would you clarify something for me on act of production immunity? Does act of production immunity go beyond this scenario that I'm going to state? You ask for a computer from a witness. Uh, you give that witness act of production immunity that, in my interpretation, is that the agent who has that now in his or her, her hands, uh, the witness is immune from the agent getting on the stand and saying, that person, this is that person's computer because they gave it to me. Does it go beyond that? And, or was there additional immunity for Ms. Mills stating that anything on that computer cannot be used against her. 
As I recall it, uh, Congressman, the act of production immunity for Ms. Mills was, you give us this computer, we will not use, we the Justice Department, anything we find on the computer directly against you um, in connection with investigation or prosecution for mishandling of classified information. But I, think it, that's, I think that's how they defined it. But, but it is, that goes beyond act of production. Doesn't act of production simply state that I'm the agent, I can't get on the stand and say that belongs to that individual because they simply gave it to me. It sounds like more additional immunity was given that, simple, that says, and what is on this, we cannot hold against you. Well, I think of it as, a, I, I still think of it as an act of production immunity. That, that, from my experience, that's what I would characterize that agreement. I guess you're right, there could be a more limited form of act of production immunity, which simply says, your fact of giving us this object will not be used against you directly. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to think through whether it can be parsed that way. But I, I think I take your point. So, so that's why I'm saying additional immunity was given, and, and, and I don't think it was uh, uh, warranted at that point. Let me, let me ask you this. We both impaneled many grand juries, investigative grand juries. Why not impanel an investigative grand jury whereby you have reasonable suspicion that a crime may have been committed, and then you have the ability to get warrants, subpoenas, get this information, subpoena witnesses before the grand jury under oath, and if they take the fifth, if it's not the target, if they take the fifth they simply, they, and say, we're not, I'm not going to talk to you, you can give them, whether it's use immunity, the AG can give them that, and, and you had that authority, and then transactional has to come from the judge. And if they refuse to testify then, then you can say, fine, we're going to take you before a judge, hold you in contempt, and then you're going to sit in jail until you answer our questions. Wouldn't that have been much simpler and more effective than the way this has gone about? I know that I've done it many, many times, and sometimes we find a situation where there isn't enough evidence, and most of the time we find there is enough evidence. Yeah. No, it's a reasonable question. The, and I don't want to talk about grand jury in connection with this case. That's why I posed case. it the way I right. did. Right. You, you, from our training, we know we're never supposed to talk about grand jury yes. publicly, but I can answer more generally than that. Um, if any time you're talking about the prospect of subpoenaing a computer from a lawyer that involves the lawyer's practice of law, you know you're getting into a big McGilla. Okay, I, I need, look, please, uh, uh, please let me interrupt you. Sure. I, I understand that clearly. Why did you not decide to go to an investigative grand jury? It would have been cleaner. It would have been much simpler, and you would have had more authority to make these witnesses testify. Not the target, but the witness testify. That seems the way to go, uh, Director. We've done it thousands of times. This just was too convoluted. Yeah, again, I, I, I need to steer clear of talking about uh, grand jury use in a particular matter. Um, in general, in my experience, you can often do things faster with um, informal agreements, uh, especially when you're interacting with lawyers. In this particular investigation, the investigative team really wanted to get access to the laptops that were used to sort these emails. Okay, one more Those are lawyers' laptops. That is a very complicated thing. I think they were able to navigate it pretty well to get us access. The media says that uh, Ms. Clinton repeated, the media says, 41 times that I do not recall or do not remember or variations of that. Is that a fact? Or I don't know. I'm not, I'm not counting. I've read the 302, obviously. Wouldn't that be taken into consideration? I'm sorry? Wouldn't that selective memory be taken into consideration? Sure. The nature and quality of a subject's memory is always a factor. Right. My time has expired. Thank you, sir. Okay. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Washington State, Ms. Thank Delvaney, you, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Director Comey, for spending all this time with us today. Um, in 2010, the White House set up the Vulnerabilities Equities Process, the VEP, and implemented it in 2014. So it could give the government a process for determining whether, how, and when to disclose vulnerabilities to technology companies so that they would be able to address those vulnerabilities and patch them. And in a couple situations, I know there was disclosure from the FBI in April of this year 
The FBI informed Apple of a security flaw in older versions of iOS and OS 10. Um, its first vulnerability disclosure to Apple under the vulnerability equities process. Um, in May of this year, the FBI Cyber Division warned the private sector about a fake USB device charger that can log the keystrokes of certain wireless keyboards. And that was 15 months after the FBI discovered the vulnerability. Um, in the warning, the FBI stated, quote, if placed strategically in an office or other location where individuals might use wireless devices, a malicious cyber actor could potentially harvest personally identifiable information, intellectual property, trade secrets, passwords, or other sensitive information, end, end quote. Um, other instances of the FBI using the VEP are scarce. And indeed, there have been reports that it's rare for the FBI to use this process. And so I wanted to you know, ask you why this is and what's your view of the process? Thank you for that question. The process seems to me to be a reasonable process to, to in a structured fashion, bring everybody who might have an, uh, an optic on this in the government together to talk about how do we think about disclosing a particular vulnerability to the private sector as against the equities that may be at stake in terms of national security uh, in particular. And so I think it makes sense to have such a process. Um, the FBI participates in it when we come across a vulnerability that we know the vulnerability and, and that falls within the VEP's jurisdiction. I don't know the particulars of the uh, case. You said there was a 15-month delay in disclosing a particular vulnerability. I don't know enough to react to that. Probably wouldn't react in an open forum in any event, but that, that's my overall reaction. And does every vulnerability you discover go through this process in terms of understanding whether or not you would disclose? I think there's a definition of what falls under the process. You have to know the vulnerability. So we have to have knowledge of, so what is it that allows it, uh, the, the vulnerability to be exploited? We didn't, for example, in the San Bernardino case. We bought uh, access, but we didn't know the vulnerability, what was behind it. Uh, but I forget the definition as I sit here of which vulnerabilities have to be considered. And so is there another process that you might use that's different from the VEP um, when you're looking at um, I don't know vulnerabilities and whether Before or not Before the they... VEP, I know our folks would routinely have make in, uh, disclosure to private entities, but I, I don't think there's a, I don't know of a process outside of VEP. And so, and, but you're not sure if in every situation the VEP is used whenever you discover a vulnerability. Sounds like a circular answer, but <laughs> if it's a, and obviously I, I didn't read the VEP before coming here today, I, we could get smart on it very quickly and have somebody talk to you about it. But if it falls in the definition of things that have to be discussed at the VEP, of course we do. I just can't remember what that definition is exactly. Okay, I, I'm trying to understand if a vulnerability is discovered if there's always a standard process that you would go through to understand whether or not that's, um, that information would be disclosed, and if that process is the VEP, that's the... Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, whether there's a set of vulnerabilities so that would fall outside of the VEP process, and if, if that's the case, how do we deal with it? I, I don't know sitting here. Thanks. If you have other feedback on that, I'd appreciate it at another time. Okay. Um, in August, you said that stakeholders needed to take some time to collect information on the going dark issue and come back after, afterward to have an adult conversation. Um, and I agree with you. And so I wondered if you would agree that there's room for us to work together um, on ways to help law enforcement that don't include mandating a backdoor. Totally. I keep reading that I'm an advocate of backdoors. I want to mandate backdoors. I am not. I have never advocated we have to have back doors. We have to figure out how we can solve this problem together, and it has to be everybody who cares about it coming together to talk about it. I don't know exactly what the answer is, frankly. I can see the problem, which I think is my job, is to tell people the tools you're counting on us to use to keep you safe, they're less and less effective, that's a big problem. But what to do and how to do it is, is a really complicated thing, and I think everybody has to participate. Thank you, thank you so much for that, and I yield back, Mr. Chair. Chair, thanks. The gentlewoman recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by acknowledging progress. I think it's important that we do so. This morning, we've had nine straight Democrats talk to the FBI about emails without asking for immunity. That's a record. And I suspect the reason that they have not asked for immunity from Director Comey is um, they would say they've done nothing wrong. 
I find that interesting because that's exactly what Heather Samuelson and Cheryl Mills' attorneys said. Um, in fact, they said it just a few days ago, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote it. The FBI considered my clients to be witnesses and nothing more. And then Ms. Mills and Ms. Samuelson's attorney said this. I think this is the most interesting part. The Justice Department assured us my clients did nothing wrong. Well, Mr. Chairman, if you're assuring subjects or targets or what witnesses, whatever you want to call them, that they've done nothing wrong, it does beg the question, what are you seeking and receiving immunity from? I mean, if you've done nothing wrong, laptops don't go to the Bureau of Prisons, Mr. Chairman. People do. So the immunity was not for the laptop. The immunity was for Cheryl Mills. And if the Department of Justice says you've done nothing wrong, it does beg the question of why you are seeking or receiving immunity. And it could be, Mr. Chairman, for a couple of different, it could be for the classified information that was the, the genesis of the investigation. It could be for the destruction of federal records which came from that initial investigation, or it could be uh, both. Um, Mr. Comey, I want to I ask you this. Did the Bureau interview everyone who originated an email that ultimately went to Secretary Clinton that contained classified information? I don't think so. Nearly everyone, but not everyone. Well, you and I had a discussion the last time about intent. You and I uh, see the statute differently. My opinion doesn't matter. Yours does. You're the head of the Bureau. But, but in my judgment, you read an element into the statute that does not appear on the face of the statute. And then we had a discussion about intent. So why would you not interview the originator of the email to, number one, determine whether or not that originator had a conversation with the secretary herself? There were a handful of people who we just, the team decided it wasn't a, a smart use of resources to track down. One was a civilian in Japan, I, as I recall, who had forwarded something that somehow got classified as it went up. And the other were a group of low-level State Department people deployed around the world who had written things that ended up being classified. Nearly everyone was interviewed, but there was a small group that the team decided it isn't worth the resources. Well, to that extent, um, if you interview the overwhelming majority of the originators of the email, will you make those 302s available to Congress? Because I counted this morning 30-something 302s that we do not have. Okay. I'll go back and check. My goal is maximum transparency, uh, consistent with our, our obligations under the law. Um, I'll check on that. Well, I, and I appreciate it. For, for this reason, uh, intent is awfully hard to prove, mm -hmm. very rarely. Uh, do uh, defendants announce ahead of time, I intend to commit this crime on this date. Go ahead and check the code section. I'm going to do it. Uh, that rarely happens. So you have to prove it by circumstantial evidence, uh, such as whether or not the person intended to set up an email system outside the State Department, uh, such as whether or not the person knew or should have known that his or her job involved handling classified information, uh, whether or not the person was truthful about the use of multiple devices, uh, whether or not the person knew that a frequent emailer to her had been hacked, and whether she took any remedial steps after being put on notice that your email or someone who's been emailing with you prolifically had been hacked, and whether or not, and I think you would agree with this, Director, um, false exculpatory statements are gold in a courtroom. I would rather have a false exculpatory statement than a confession. I would rather have someone lie about something and it be provable that that is a lie, such as uh, that I neither sent nor received classified information, uh, such as that I turned over all of my work-related emails. All of that, to me, goes to the issue of intent. So i got two more questions, then I'm going to be out of time. For those who may have to prosecute these cases in the future, what would she have had to do to warrant your recommendation of a prosecution? If all of that was not enough, because all of that's what she did, if all of that's not enough, I mean, surely you cannot be arguing that you have to have an intent to harm the United States to be subject to this prosecution. I mean, that, that's treason. That's no. not a violation of this statute. 
No, I think we'd have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt a general awareness of the, of the unlawfulness of your conduct. You knew you were doing something you shouldn't do. And then, obviously that's the, on the face of the statute itself, then you need to consider, so who else has been prosecuted and in what circumstances, because it's all about prosecutorial judgment. But those two things would be the key, key questions. Can you prove that the person knew they were doing something they shouldn't do, a general uh, criminal intent, general mens rea, but the, but and the have way you treated to prove, other people similarly? The way to prove that is whether or not someone took steps to conceal or destroy what they've done. That is the best evidence you have, that they knew it was wrong, yeah. that they lied about it. It's, often, well, it's very good evidence. I, I, always want to look at what the subject said about their conduct. Well, I, and there's a lot. There's a lot. If you saw her initial press conference, it all falls under the heading of false exculpatory statement. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, but the, the, the director did. It, you started off by uh, giving us examples of things the Bureau um, has done. And, and, and every one of us who's worked with the FBI, that is, that is the FBI that I know. Uh, the one that went and saved that girl in North Carolina, that is the FBI that I know. What concerns me, Director, is when you have five immunity agreements and no prosecution, when you are allowing witnesses who happen to be lawyers, who happen to be targets, to sit in on an interview, that is not the FBI that I used to work with. So I've been really careful to not criticize you. In fact, I said it again this morning. They wanted to know, was he gotten to? Did somebody corrupt him? No, I just disagree with you. But it's really important to me that the FBI be respected. And, and, and you, you, you got to help us understand, because it looks to me like some things were done differently that I don't recall being done back when I used to work with them. And with that, I would yield back to the chairman. Can I respond to that? Yes, you may. Um, I hope someday when this the political craziness is over, you will look back again on this, because this is the FBI you know and love. This was done by pros in the right way. That's the part I have no patience for. Sorry, sir. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Comey, uh, for your extraordinary service to our country. And please uh, convey to the professionals at the FBI uh, my gratitude for their exemplary service to the people of this country. And particularly, I want to acknowledge the extraordinary, prompt, and effective response uh, to the recent bombings in New Jersey and New York. Uh, it's just another example of this extraordinary agency and your extraordinary leadership. Um, Director Comey, many of us have expressed a concern about uh, the growing incidence of gun violence in this country, and we expressed condolences and concern uh, following the recent mass shootings in Burlington, Washington, where five people uh, lost their lives. We shared the same sentiments after incidents in Aurora and Newtown and Charleston, uh, but as uh, as more Americans lose their lives to senseless gun violence, this Congress has been absolutely silent and inactive on this issue. So I'd like to uh, really turn to you and your career in public service, and both as a U.S. attorney and now as the FBI director, with so much experience in dealing with the consequences of gun violence, uh, and ask you to kind of share with us what you think might be some things Congress could do to help reduce gun violence in this country. Um, I know, if I recall correctly, in 2013, during our confirmation hearings, you at least alluded to your support for universal background checks, uh, bans on illegal trafficking of guns, assault weapons, and high-capacity magazines. So I'm wondering what you think would be effective for us to do to help reduce the incidence of gun violence in this country. No, thank you, Congressman. Uh, and you're exactly right. We just spend a lot of time thinking, investigating, and mourning uh, the deaths in uh, mass shootings. I think it's really important, though, that the Bureau not be in the policy business and uh, be in the enforcement business. And so I'm going to respectfully uh, avoid your question, honestly, because I, I think we should not be in the place of – we should be a factual input to you. We should not be suggesting particular laws uh, with respect to guns or anything else. So uh, let me ask you, Director, about a very specific enforcement challenge. Uh, I introduced a piece of legislation called the Unlawful Gun Buyer Alert Act to get at this issue of a default proceeds. This is where people buy a gun, uh, they purchase a gun, but they are not permitted to buy one under law, but the three-day time period has elapsed. And between 2010 and 2014, 15,729 sales to prohibited persons occurred. That means people who were not lawfully permitted to buy a gun got a gun 15,000 times. Uh, so my legislation would require that when that happens, that local law enforcement is notified. 
they can then make a decision. Should we go prosecute this person who's now in possession of a gun illegally? Should we you know, execute a search warrant? But they would at least be put on notice. In your community, a person who should not have a gun bought one so they can take some action. Would that make sense in terms of your enforcement responsibilities? It, it might. Uh, I know ATF is notified in those circumstances. Right. Which, so of course, is a very different set of priorities for ATF. Do they go and actually execute a warrant and charge somebody? But there are state and local uh, prohibitions on that that could, other, could, could be acted upon. So would it also make sense to notify local law enforcement? Uh, it might. I, I want to have think through and ask ATF how do they think through the deconfliction issues mm -hmm. that might arise there, but it, it's a reasonable thing to look at. Uh, the second, uh, my next question, uh, Director, is uh, there has been a recent discussion about implementing stop and frisk in cities to address crime, even at the national level. And although the data shows that this disproportionately targets people of color, and just to give you some context, in 2011, when stop and frisk activity reached an all-time high in New York City, police stopped 685,000 people. 53% of those individuals were black. 34% were Latino, and 9% were white. More than half were ages 14 to 24 years old. And of the 685,000 people that were stopped and frisked, 88% were neither arrested nor received any sort of citation. Do you believe this stop and frisk policy is an effective tactic to address crime in our nation's cities? What would a federal implementation look like that uh, Mr. Trump has called for? And how can Congress minimize racial profiling and discriminatory ineffective techniques like stop and fricks and instead promote activities that build trust and confidence between the police and the community. I don't know what a federal uh, program would look like because we're not in the policing business. We're investigative agencies at the federal level. But the Terry stop, the stop and frisk is not a term we use in the federal system. The Terry stop, which is a stop of an individual based on reasonable suspicion that they're engaged in criminal activity, is a very important law enforcement tool. To my mind, its effectiveness depends upon the conversation after the stop. When it's done well, someone is stopped, then they are told, I stopped you because. We have a report of a guy with a gray sweatshirt who matches you. That's why I stopped you, sir. I'm sorry or I stopped you because I saw you do this behavior. Because the danger is what, what's an effective law enforcement technique can become a source of estrangement for a community, and you need the help of the community. So it's an important tool when used right, and what makes the difference between right and wrong is what's the nature of the conversation with the person you stopped. Thank you, Director. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to finally associate myself with the remarks of Congressman Deutsch regarding the Logan Act violations and the remarks of many of my colleagues regarding the attempts by the Russians to interfere with our democracy and electoral process and take great comfort in the director's uh, commitment to uh, continue to understand this as an important responsibility of the agency to, to protect the integrity of our democracy. And with that, I yield back. Chair, thanks. Gentlemen, chair recognizes the